barely see my breath surrounded by jealousy and death. I can't be reached, only have a contract underneath, separate from you all. Once they closed all the theaters, they turned them into clubs. But since clubs are illegal now, they're not called clubs, they're called memories. And every memory is haunted by a different play. Thank you for coming. We're not open yet. I'm not till midnight. But you can hang around. It'll be fun. What with all the new variants, every night is a super spreader. But nobody dies anymore. They just keep getting older. This is an open rehearsal for a proposed adaptation of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. I am the person doing the adaptation. I am a queer cis male born and raised in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia to fifth and sixth generation Scottish immigrants. I go by my given name, Daniel McIver, and my pronouns are he, his. Currently, I am here in the role of artist in residence at Cape Breton University. This land we are currently on was first known as Unamaki and was inhabited by the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet First Nations and is colonially known as Cape Breton Island and functions under, under the governance of the Peace and Friendship Treaties of 1760. As I said previously, this is an open rehearsal for a proposed adaptation of the play Hamlet. The initial concept of adapting Hamlet came as a result of my current enrollment in the MA program at the Center of Drama, Theater and Performance Studies at the University of Toronto. As part of our graduate laboratory under the guidance of Professor Matthew Jocelyn, the cohort was asked to adapt one of three Shakespeare plays, As You Like It, The Tempest, or Hamlet. I chose Hamlet because it was the play that interested me the most, and I felt it was the play of the three that I was most familiar with. The aim of the laboratory is to interrogate the idea of adaptation 
resulting in a 20-minute presentation either in the form of a live or recorded event. For my laboratory, I have chosen to present a recorded event which will be distilled from this open rehearsal. The object of the 20-minute presentation is to reduce Hamlet to its essential minute. Uh, that relates to this larger adaptation presented now only in that the minute will exist within it. But it is not the purpose of this exercise, which I am calling How Am I Hamlet? Originally, the title was I was working with was Why Am I Hamlet? But as I continued my research and investigation, I became less interested in the question of why and more in the idea of how. Also, my interest shifted from the main character to the play itself, not to ask why does this melancholic prince reside within my own obsessions and fears? But how does this play and its themes reflect upon and through my own experiences and theatrical biases? And as I think it will be revealed over the course of uh, this open rehearsal, uh, it's the presence and dramaturgical issues around Ophelia that seem to spark most interest for me. Uh, this rehearsal will move between uh, short lectures, pre-recorded live discussions with guests, design-centered conversations, perhaps arguments with the technicians working with me. Christopher Jones, will you be arguing with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. I bet he, I don't think that's necessarily true, but you know. Um, he would be happy to argue with me if I started an argument, though. There will also be puppet show that I will enact scenes from uh, calling, I'm calling that the mini Hamlet. Uh, it's a 20-minute version of the play, not to be confused with my 20-minute master's lab. And mostly I will be involved in a considered investigation of what I'm calling How Am I Hamlet? The first scene of which you witnessed as the opening of the performance. The concept is that a global pandemic has closed all the theaters and now they operate illegally as after hours nightclubs. Each of these clubs are haunted or possessed or obsessed or overrun by a different play. The name of this club is the state of Denmark and its obsession possession is Hamlet. I am the host preparing for this evening's festivities. Sometimes it will be very clear when we're moving from one state to another. Sometimes it will all feel like it's all the state of Denmark. Um, so what we're presenting to you here online is a selection of moments from this open rehearsal. Um, feel free to be with us as a meditation of theater or fast forward your way through it. Um, as I said, there will be a puppet show and um, there'll also be guests uh, with whom I will attack or celebrate or challenge or marvel upon Hamlet or Shakespeare or my interpretation of either of those things. And at the end, I will offer you what I'm calling the Nano Hamlet, which is the play condensed into one minute, the, the essence of the play. And so, again, thank you for coming. Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole, taken to wife. But now, my cousin, Hamlet, and my son, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so much, my lord. I am too much in the sun. 
Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common that all lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these mourning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. For your intent, in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier's son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall, in all my best, obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Come away. All that lives must die. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Helmut. I pray thee, stay with us. Ophelia, 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 I do wish that your good duties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanted way again to both your honors. Hamlet, Ophelia, 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 Hamlet, Ophelia, Ophelia, Hamlet, Hamlet, Hamlet. Thou hast thy father much offended. Have you forgot me? What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in my ears. No more. Whereon do you look? To whom do you speak this? This is the very cornage of your brain. O oh, Hamlet, O oh, Hamlet, O oh, Hamlet, O oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. All that lives must die. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Helmut. I pray thee, stay with us. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a Jew, or that the everlasting had not set his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fine and awful, it is an ugly garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature, possess it merely. That it should come to this but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two. So excellent the king that was to this, Hyperion to his satyr, so loving to my mother, he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember why she would hang on him, as if, in, as if increase in appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think in it, frailty, thy name is woman, a little month or ere though shoes were old, which she followed my poor father's body like Nagami all tears. little month. Oh God, oh God, a beast that wants to score some reason would have mourned longer married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules within a month. Ere yet the tears of most unrighteous grief had left a flushing in her galled eyes she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come. It is not, nor it cannot come. It is not, nor it cannot come. It is not, nor it cannot come to good.
What art thou that hast usurped this time of night? Speak. Hello. Hello. Um, hello, stranger. Hello, old friend. Would you, I, I will ask you please to introduce yourself. My name is Daniel Brooks. Is that it? Is that all you want? You want the bio, you want the full biography? Well, or? For people that don't have the internet and they can't Google, maybe just give us a little, a little something. Um, do I, do I exist in relationship to things other than you? <laughs> Because I could start when we met. Only, only, only not related to, oh, I we only want the credits that aren't related to me. Um, yeah, well, I've been uh, kicking around in the Canadian theater scene for uh, much of my adult life. I have uh, two uh, wonderful daughters, um, both she and her. So there's two she's and two hers. Um, and I live in the city of Toronto and I've worked with you since 1990, about that? I think so. Sounds about right. that, yeah. Um, and currently, uh, uh, I'll say two things. One, I'll say, I'm, cur I'm, I'm actually, <clears throat> I am currently working on a documentary called, called Everything is Real, Nothing is True, which a, 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 a big part of that is our Working relationships but a big part of that. So the, there'll be great insight for the, the masses when that's released. Um, and the other thing I want to say is I think I would say that I would say that you are with one of the um, top three stage directors in the country. That's what I would say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to interrupt. Keep going. <laughs> That's all I'm going to give you. But I thought you were going to ask which, why the top three, like which, what number I'm yeah. like, that would make me three. Why would you say top three if you were, I would say top two, if you were. Well, you didn't say third, you said top three. Yeah, so because, like, that think, could be, I feel like we're moving around in a triangle, the three of us. Exactly. Whoever we are. Whoever y'all are. Yeah. But I would definitely say you're, you, you, I, I saw your, Although I think Beckett's a little out of favor these days, but I did say, I, th I saw uh, you did a, a Gatto. I think that, I'm a little out of favor these days. That's, that's that's okay. well, and that's another, that's another open rehearsal. Um, but uh, no, I saw you did a Gatto that I thought was like the most impeccable thing um, with a company in Toronto called Soul Pepper. That was amazing. Anyway, enough about all that. We're not here to talk about Beckett. We're here to talk about Omelette. Please speak to me of Hamlet. Just like that? <laughs> You're not going to give me any more to go on? Well, we, we narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> we have been discussing this, obviously. You want me to talk about my Hamlet? Well, we've been just, we have obviously been discussing this over the course of my, my looking at all of this. And um, 
one of the things that I thought was really interesting that I hadn't considered, well, there was lots I hadn't considered, but one of the things that I thought was very interesting was you talked about that, that he, well, two things. One thing is this idea that he is a creature of study, that he is in the world of study, which is somewhat interesting, but even more interesting, and maybe this is what you can speak to us, is that when this play premiered, when this play happened, there, people hadn't seen anything like it before. Yeah. Now you talk. <laughs> well, you cast me as a historian, which I'm not. Okay. Um, we'll just, however, um, what about it was, what about this play? Uh, let's say it's, I, I mean, this is a bold statement. I never thought of it this way, but it's almost like the equivalent of, uh, of what James Joyce threw on the pile of, lit of world literature uh, when he, um, explored a kind of stream of consciousness, a way of exploring human thought and internal processes um, through literature um, <clears throat> that, that had never been done before. Um, uh, similarly, I think Hamlet explores the internal processes of thought of an individual uh, in a way that it had never been done before as far as I know that um, and who was it was it the, the, the there was a famous uh, paper on it called the, the Hamlet and the invention of the self um, that the the idea of, uh, of an individualized self who um, cogitates and who is wrapped into a uh, particular um, place and time in the world, but within that place and time has their own individual um, mental processes um, that are fundamentally unique and meaningful. I think there's something that Shakespeare did with that character in, in the context of rotten Denmark that um, was an expression of, of the individual that, that the world had not seen in that way. Harold Bloom yeah. likes to um, play, plays pretty hard this, this idea of the actor. He is the actor. But he also, he says, he refers to him as the, the playwright. He, he writes himself, he says, Hamlet, but he, but he makes a big, a lot about the fact that, and, not, and not, Harold Bloom isn't alone in this, um, Auden, I don't know if we discussed this, but I talked to you about this, Auden, I'm going to be doing this Auden lecture um, that where he, he kind of takes the piss out of it all. And, and he also refers to um, uh, Hamlet as an actor, but in it, like it dismissively, but, but Bloom kind of makes, <laughs> elevates that. Um, that seems related to me, with this idea of the self and uh, analyzing the self and the act. The performance, <clears throat> the performance of the self. The performance of the self. Yes. Yes. And the uh, um, constant uh, ability or curse that Hamlet has uh, uh, of looking at himself from the outside, of analyzing himself and his actions in, in time, um, <clears throat> is it, 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 so that there are different kind of actors within Hamlet. Right. I mean, it's, there's an inconsistency, which I, which I keep seeing, uh, you know, in my small minded way, I suppose the big mind, not <clears throat> big mind, small mind, but my small mind keeps seeing dramaturgical problems because I'm expecting it to be dramaturgical, dra dra the dramaturgy to be lean into psychology a little bit more. Uh, there are like this idea that, you know, Bloom talks about the Hamlet of the first four acts and then the Hamlet of act five, that there's this, that he becomes a man basically uh, by act, like the Hamlet we need in act five is not the Hamlet we've met previously. Um, now he attributes that somewhat to the trip with the pirates and whatnot, but, but you know, um, um, but, it never uh, happened. I mean, his leaving home at that point is is an important part of the image of a psychological process, I think. 
So I, I would agree with him. I mean, it's not nothing to do with the pirates specifically, but right. But I do, unless I, unless the pirates had their way with him, and that might have changed things. Well, that's uh, that that now there's a play. Forget about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. The pirates had their way with me. The Hamlet, my Hamlet speaks verbatim. Um, uh, yes, pirates. I, so why would you write pirates in a play and not show them? What an opportunity. What a, what a missed opportunity. Budget. <laughs> Budget. Um, it's such a delight to learn things to just during this research that Shakespeare was in the premiere and that he played the ghost and that he played the player king. It's so, and that, and, and, the, the, and how he was giving notes to people sort of inside the play. What fun that all is. It's, it's quite a bit of fun. Maybe that's why it's so damn long. But giving notes to people, you mean, do you mean the advice to the player? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it's quite fun when you think of it that way. It's a very, it's a complex, I mean, it's, and then there's the Ophelia problem, which I've realized as I'm going through all this material and assembling this, you know, rehearsal, that I've got a lot of attention. I, Ophelia takes much of my attention, and I think it's because there's such a, it's such a bump for me um, that overlooked but the, the, the lack of dramaturgy on it, but it can't, it just feels like it has to be intentional or it's lazy. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't. I mean, there's only so many things that, so many places the attention can go and he went pretty deeply into a lot of different territory. It is as if we only see Ophelia from the outside. We don't get much of a, of a sense of her inner workings. And, and when she cracks open, um, it's hard to decipher the codes in her language, but they're, they're there. And, um, and, and if you look at her story without being too concerned with the moment by moment psychology, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting. Yeah, this, yes, and this is something that we have talked about pre previously. Was this this when I when I complained about this sort of holes in dramaturgy? Uh, you, you had said to me, "Well, this is part of the appeal of, of, of this play." And and Shakespeare, I guess, more generally, is that there's lots of room for directors um, to to kind of to develop things. Yeah. There's an enormous amount of room. And as I say, I think the, the stories are so evocative. Um, you know, here's a young woman who is in, in love, whatever that means, with a man, uh, a prince, a, a high-minded and apparently very intelligent and uh, admirable young man. And she somehow loses him suddenly. He lies to her. He... Um, says the, the cruelest and oddest things to her. And then suddenly he kills her father. And she sees this world around her that she clearly saw in some way as a fairly protected young woman uh, with fairly naive eyes begins to see very quickly the, the cruelty that exists in the world. And it, breaks her. That's always been my, you know, reading, that reduced reading in a nutshell of what happens to Ophelia. And I think it's a powerful story and very much in, in realm with one of the things that interests me very much about the play, which is how do we contend with what we perceive as evil in the world? God, it's so, you know, the way you speak about it, it's so generous and so, it, and it's so powerful. It, it to, like suddenly, just by just listening to you talk about it like that, that suddenly you see this sort of, suddenly you see these images of like a character never in the light, like always kind of never quite the focus. And, right. and that that means something. And that actually can be really potentially powerful in a, if in a in a in a contemporary uh, 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 um, position in contemporary in a contemporary way, 
um, there's sure, and you can and you can you can look at you could you do extend that in her relationship to to Hamlet if you want to look at Hamlet as a narcissist, which is possible. Um, you can you know the, the the classic thing about a narcissist is when their light shines on you, you feel like you're the center of the world, and when they remove that light, you feel deserted and desiccated and useless. You feel like you and and uh, that's partially what happens to Ophelia. I wanted to just to finish. I just wanted to uh, talk just a moment about Claudius, and because uh, you 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 helped me out with Claudius, and and um, <clears throat> uh, this notion of um, you know it was uh, Matthew Jocelyn who introduced me to this to this the, the idea that it's it's an idea I suppose that's been kicked around is that is <clears throat> that uh, Claudius is 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 doing what he needs to do. Um, and and not 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 the villain that people like to play. Mm -hmm. as. I thought that was real, and I just felt I hadn't considered that. I guess. Um, it's you know I, I he'd have to take me through the play to to support that. Um, I mean the praying scene. The praying scene feels like very very when he's at prayer, and there feels like there's stuff in there that makes him aware, again, he's aware of himself or he's aware of his actions in a way that you feel like this is not out of evil. Or there's a recognition that his, his ambitions are purely worldly. Mm. Well, that's different again. But this is this. But the other conversation about this is new, old order, new order, right? That's a common, that's a common approach, is that that King Hamlet was this old order, and Claudius is somehow trying to help in help this new order to come in, right? That seems to be a common take. E, e, um, I guess it could be, and then perhaps the result of that new order is disorder, and that is often the, the, the price of the new order, is it creates tremendous chaos. <clears throat> because once you break a social contract, and once you break a, 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 a social um, agreement, shall we say, um, whether it's uh, a, a, social, a society that is just or not just, and however you measure such things anyway, it usually leads to murder and a stage filled with bodies. Carnage. Remove the bodies. Go, go, go. Bid, bid go the soldiers go shoot. Bid the soldiers shoot. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the. You know, I saw, I saw a production um, in which uh, William Hutt played Claudius. It was a beautiful performance. And he, he was like, he, he had a cold through most of it. He was constantly blowing his nose and he was such a delicate creature and so sympathetic. And it, for me, it, it kind of utterly undermined the drama of the play. That there was nothing, there was no force that Hamlet was opposing. There was no reason for his torment. There was no uh, world in which he was setting himself against. Um, and I think that whether you view him as evil or not, Claudius uh, has to be a man of worldly ambitions, however you view those. God, that is so, that's so, that's, yeah, it, 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 that's so, the choices need to be uh, over choices, not interior choices. They need to be considering. I, I, I think so, because also, because Hamlet opposes that, and I'm not saying it's a simple binary in the play, but he is coming from Wittenberg. He is a man of, of ideas. A man of ideas. I could talk to you about this all day, but you know. You kicking me off? Yeah. Next. <laughs> have you got number? Got, has you got, got number number two and three coming? I got a lot to do. 
Have um, you got number two and three coming? Uh, everybody's lined up. Everybody. You know what I mean by number two and three? No. <laughs> well, I'll leave that with you to puzzle over. Oh no, is this a reference, a Hamlet reference? I missed no, it. No, it's a reference to how we began our discussion. Oh. Oh, 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 <laughs> yes, thank you, sorry. I, it took me a minute. Um, Yes, I know. I only only you of the triad. Uh, the, the three may be different, but, the, but when I said it earlier, it, some minutes ago, it could, the three could have changed. Yes, the top three. But I, I might even be. No, I might no, even be no. off the list. You're always in the top three. Okay. All right. All have right. a great day. I love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. And sister, for Hamlet in the trifling of his favor, forward not permanent, sweet not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more but so. Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor coddle doth besmirch his virtue of his will, but you must fear, his greatness weighed, his will is not his own. Do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles a puffed and reckless libertine himself the primrose path of dalliance treads and reeks not his own reed. Oh, I stay too long, but here our father comes. What is it, Ophelia, he hath said to you? So please you something touching the Lord Hamlet. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Do not believe his vows, for they are brokers not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious bonds the better to beguile. I shall obey, my lord. Mark me. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. If thou didst ever thy dear father love, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. The serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown.
Poem Unlimited by Harold Bloom. Harold Bloom calls his, his 2003 book, Poem Unlimited, a postulate to his much-influenced 1998 tome, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, in which Bloom looks at all 38 plays with the rigor of an archaeologist and the poet poetic sensibility of a bard. The title is taken from Polonius' speech in Hamlet scene with the players, where he states, the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, historical, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, scene individual, or poem unlimited. He describes the book as the fulfillment of my desire to remedy my prior obsessiveness to what he calls the finest character ever created by a playwright to whom he refers to as his mortal god. In this book, Bloom says that the central question here is, how did Hamlet develop into so extraordinarily ambivalent a consciousness? Though he does not follow that through entirely, nor offers no concrete answer beyond examples. He insists that Hamlet had little in common with his father, mother, nor uncle, and sees him as a kind of changeling nurtured by Yorick and fathered by himself. Bloom makes much of the fact that this surrogate father, Yorick, was an actor in his role as the king's jester, and that as a result, Hamlet, as an actor-playwright, is an actor-playwright from the start. Bloom suggests that Shakespeare might have subtitled Hamlet, The Rehearsal, because he says it is a play about playing and about acting out rather than avenging. Later, Bloom suggests another subtitle for the play as A Cry of Players. Uh, um, and maintains that Shakespeare's theatricalism is in none of his plays so aggressive as it is in Hamlet. Bloom references the scholar Richard Lanham as observing that Hamlet, in Hamlet, Shakespeare is writing a play about the kind of play he is writing, and goes on to quote Lanham as brilliantly echoing Hamlet when he says that, in general terms, human flesh is sullied with self-consciousness with theatricality. Here is raised a dialogue between these two terms, self-consciousness and theatricality. Is the play Hamlet and its central character sullied by either or both to the point where we lose the themes to a self-reflective narcissism? Bloom suggests that this comes close to being the case, but due to the fact that with Hamlet's death, where consciousness of the self and the soul become one thing, the themes manage to ride above the waves, buoyed successfully by, as it were, this very theatricality. Also, Bloom offers that foreground to the tragedy of Hamlet is the character's consciousness of his own consciousness, unlimited yet at war with itself. This is an active narcissism, less drowning in melancholy as is often the default position when dealing with the Danish prince, but more alert and provocative, a despairing more like a hurricane than a submersion. Later in the book, Bloom references the poet W. H. Auden's comments in Auden's 1947 lecture on Hamlet to the New School of Social Research, Social Research in New York City, where Auden offers excuses for the problem that he perceives as the character's constant state of performing. Although Bloom sees this more as the subject or the core of the play rather than a weakness, he does suggest that this actor Hamlet has disappeared by Act 5, where Hamlet passes into a state that is no longer theatrically self-conscious, but rather, in Bloom's words, a stance that is indescribable. Call it quietism, disinterestness, disinterestedness, or wise passivity. Bloom attributes this change to Hamlet's sea journey to England, interrupted by pirates, and his return to Denmark, but offers no solid dramaturgical reasoning for this. One could see this wise passivity as a kind of isolation. Surely Bloom is painting the Hamlet character as alone in his ability to be, to be conscious of his consciousness, and near the end of the book, Bloom interprets Hamlet's isolation as Shakespeare's own. 
Bloom had earlier brought this kind of comparison to bear around Shakespeare writing Hamlet only three years after the death of his son Hamnet at 11 years old, and in, and in the fact of Shakespeare acting in the first productions of the play in the paternal roles of the ghost and the first player who will enact the player king. However, in the end, Bloom maintains that ransacking Hamlet is a losing process if, as with an open box, you could turn the entire play over and empty it out, its scattered contents would defy reassembly. Bloom seems to come closest to breaking the code of the play when earlier in the book he reminds us of what would have been the high humor and in-joke of Hamlet's lines to the first player when premiered on stage at the Globe Theatre. Spoken by Richard Burbage to Shakespeare himself, not as the Prince of Denmark, but in the guise of the resident dramatist of the globe, to that self-same person. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue, but if you mouth it as, you may, as many of your players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Indeed, a play about acting, the rehearsal and a cry of players. The play is indeed the thing and perhaps the answer to itself. Hello. Hi. Thank you for thank you for being a guest. Oh, thank you for asking me. Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Andrew Moody, and I'm an actor and a playwright uh, from Ottawa, Ottawa, Ontario, eh? And currently, you are in living in Toronto. Currently. Uh huh. Yeah. And um, uh, so. Uh, we go back very quite far, uh, some decades, to the what are you talking about? to the uh, to the good old days, as it were. Yeah, now yeah, remember, jeez, oh, the nineties. And another of my guests, uh, Caroline Gillis, um, who we have uh, anyway. She. Uh, tells a story that you were her first on stage kiss. I know. Uh, she wasn't mine, though. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I what I'm saying. So when she I, was great, though. She was fantastic. When I, when I reached out to you uh, about doing, talking about Hamlet, you, you had, you felt you had things, thoughts of Hamlet. Have you been in a Hamlet? Yeah, I was in the Soul Pepper production. So I played the Player King. Uh, and what else? Uh, uh, mm, I can't remember. There were, there were a couple of other characters I played. But it was really neat being inside it because, of course, on the outside of it, like I'd never seen a production of it. I just read it first. So when I was a teenager, I read Hamlet and I was just blown away. I just thought it was really great writing and, and I did not see the ending coming. And I was just like, no, don't drink the. Oh, no, she drank it. And so, uh, yeah, spoiler alert, everybody dies. Um, so I was really sort of enraptured by the play itself. And then, I mean, you know, I saw the um, Olivier version and I thought, eh, it's, it's, it, was, it was okay. But um, uh, nothing quite gripped me like the, the, the just the reading of it. And, the, uh, um, and I actually became, I fell in love with Laertes actually. I, I really loved that character. And I, I couldn't figure out for years why I, that character really resonated with me until I realized, well, I've got a sister. I've got a sister that I love really well. And I just, I really, there's something about Laertes that I just really understood. And I always wanted to play Laertes. I never wanted to play Hamlet. I was always like, and and I uh, I have a couple of Laertes speeches memorized that I still, every now and again, I, I, I pull out to this day because I just find it's, 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 it's so heartbreaking because he's not a typical villain, a theatrical villain. He's somebody who just out of love of his father and his sister seeks revenge, you know? And he's the mirror of Hamlet. I, I didn't really, I mean, I knew Hamlet. I had the choice of three Shakespeare plays to investigate. One was As You Like It, one was The Tempest and Hamlet. And I chose Hamlet, uh, as I said earlier, I say this earlier, but um, I, I chose Hamlet because it was the one I thought I knew best. 
of yep. the place. Now, of course, in fact, now having kind of delved into it, uh, I, I suppose I probably didn't know it that well, as well as I thought. But I find it so fascinating in that it, there, there, there are so many interpretations possible. Do you remember what the kind of, what was the, do you remember the gist of the sort of the soul pepper position on the Hamlet? Like what the, the what was the tone of that production? Uh, well, it was very classical dress, so it wasn't modernized. It was sort of set, uh, you know, in ancient times. Uh, and uh, I think Albert Schultz's interpretation was uh, to be as true to the text as possible. He didn't, they, they weren't trying to, they did cut it a lot, which was painful for everybody involved. But so it had to be, it had to come in shorter than four hours. But at the same time, um, uh, he did take a traditional sort of like, uh, uh, um, the, the Hamlet who is lost in uh, inactivity and depression. He wasn't like a man of action Hamlet, the Mel Gibson quote unquote Hamlet, uh, which I was very glad about. Um, and I thought he did a very good job. Like the, the, the play, once you're on the inside of it, the play is uh, deceptive. It's, it's, um, it's quite, a it's a tour de force of writing and also uh, of acting. Like Shakespeare the actor, this is a play for Shakespeare the actor. There are lots of, like, you know, throughout Shakespeare's oeuvre, there are many different uh, uh, plays and types of plays that serve different purposes. You know, there's the comic Shakespeare, there's the tragedian, there's the, you know, the, the, the lover of horror with uh, Titus Andronicus, right? Um, but it, more than anything, uh, Hamlet, it really is a, a celebration and a love letter to actors and acting and performance and, um, and, and how you know, how human beings can express themselves in performance and how seeing a performance can affect your soul and, and cause you to, to uh, you know, communicate truths that even when you don't intend to. So, you, and there's something, sorry, go ahead. You played the player King. Yeah. Which was Shakespeare played. Yeah, 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 it was an honor. And also too, doing it, I was just like, holy fuck, this is hard. <laughs> like this is, this is a really hard part because it, uh, uh, you, the, the way it's written, um, uh, Hamlet then turns to his friend and says, you know, hey, look, this this king, this player king, who's an actor, had tears in his eyes and distraction in his aspect. And for what? For Hecuba. But who is he to Hecuba and Hecuba him that he should weep for him? For her. And so uh, uh, every performance, I've got to give it. Every performance, I've just, because otherwise that speech makes no sense. And so every performance, I just had to, uh, to, to, to delve deep and to, to really, um, you know, not saw the air thus. Like, here's the thing. The thing I love about that play is basically Shakespeare was just like, okay, this is good acting. This is bad acting. Do not do the bad acting. This is a really important play for me. So everybody, I'm going to do this speech about how to act. And then you're going to act. <laughs> and you can't do And I've told you exactly how to do it. Don't saw the, ha ha the air with your hand. You know, every word to an action, don't overplay things, don't overbear things with your emotions, treat every word just, you know, a, a, a simply and concisely, but truthfully, you know, and um, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, Shakespeare's speech about acting is something that every actor should learn and memorize and, and just remind themselves every now and again, uh, to just, you know, to, to, to try and find honest moments on stage. You know, as da Daniel Brooks, uh, uh, when I talk to him about it, he talks about how one, of the, and I didn't think, I didn't realize this, but that for the time, the play was some un, an unseen sort of thing. It was very r radical to, to be so concerned with psychology, the psychology of this character and the things that you're talking about, the, sort of, the meta of, it was, it was uh, an, incredibly unusual for the time. It would have been quite a sensation or and probably upsetting to people. But also too, from what we are told, there were other Hamlets. There were uh, there were Ur Hamlets, these uh, other plays that don't survive to this day, but written by other, like the Hamlet story, it's not that it was an original story that Shakespeare came up with. It was just a, like a lot of playwrights who just write their version of Hamlet about the Danish Prince and and uh, uh, the reason why we have his version of Hamlet uh, is because the actors after 
you know, Shakespeare retired off to Stratford said, we should probably write this down. And that's the only reason why we have it. And uh, there's, and when you read it, you could tell that there is something in Shakespeare's soul that he just had to deal with. His son had just died. I'm sure he had complex feelings about being a father and a husband. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, his relationship with his wife, uh, um, you know, had its, had its issues, right? He was never around. Uh, she was an older woman who had children by him when he was very young, and they sort of had to get married because they had a child out of wedlock. And then he, you know, left to become an actor years later, and I'm sure would send money back. And, and he had good relations with his, his father, and he loved his father. And had such great respect for his father, so much so that he, you know, bought a proper coat of arms for their family. Um, and uh, you could tell that he's he was somebody who was a father's son. And you could tell that he was just working out a lot of complex emotions through this play about fathers and sons and regret and and also to having a father who was wronged because, you know, depending on, well, depending on which scholar you believe, uh, it's possible that uh, Shakespeare's father was a secret Catholic who uh, lost his position because of his religious beliefs. Perhaps, we don't know to, any of that to be true, but he did like, Shakespeare's father did lose a, a, a very high up position in, in town. And you could just see in Hamlet, uh, 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 just the emotions of somebody who feels like their father was wronged and that revenge should, should happen. And, uh, but Hamlet is just unsure about revenge and unsure about how or why to have revenge and, and, and feeling almost like you're, you don't live up to your father's promise. You know, There's something about that that I just think Shakespeare either felt or just understood. Maybe he didn't feel it because we don't know what Shakespeare thought or felt, but it's something that uh, uh, you could tell that he was just struggling with. Just guilt, being a good son. What does being a good son mean? You know? I, 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 that's also rich. And I, I also love that the, the, the um, you know, one of the things I've been learning in this sort of in, in this scholarship I've been reading is this idea that it's about acting. And yeah. That it's and, and some people will say that that makes it a great play, and some people will say that makes it a, th a flawed play. Uh, that that because because it's so it's about that. But what I love about the, this what I love about you, the story you tell me uh, is that but it was actors who were the heroes of the of the of the of the external story because it was the actors who saved the play. Without the actors, we wouldn't have it. So. It's not only about actors, but actors are responsible for our having it. Oh, absolutely. And also too, I have to admit, like, because uh, uh, we did Hamlet, we took it to Manitoulin Island and we performed with a First Nations uh, acting troupe and we uh, did workshops with them. And then we brought it back to Toronto. And so uh, we've, uh, 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 it was very interesting to see how First Nations interpreted the show and how they felt about it. Um, and it was also very powerful to see that certain themes of the play resonated on a more deeper level for a First Nations person than it would for me. Um, and uh, that was very, uh, it was, um, oh man, like there's so many things that were so heartbreaking about that. Uh, it's, about a, that. it's a very, you know, I mean, it's a deeply, uh, uh, moving all, all everything that you're talking about about the father, about fathers and sons but also just the in some ways I, I i feel like it's it's less a play about inactivity but but more about or the character is less about inactivity than they are about um realizing that activity to, to action is is ineffective and impossible yeah. so this there's a kind of existential horror of, of that. Absolutely. And it communicates across cultures, across generations. That's one of the reasons why I honestly think we still do the play to this very day. There are some plays that I'm sure are going to be canceled by Shakespeare. You know, uh, you know, Taming of the Shrew might not be done that often, you know, in the next- You have uh, some you know. Caliban questions, of course.
course. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's going to be the next on the chopping block. But uh, trust me, there's something very, very uh, universal about the play, um, and that um, uh, that spans the the uh, generations and also cultures. And also, too, there's parts of the play that he was very lucky. Like you know, yes, he's a good writer. At the same time, we cut down that play. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work in it. And a lot of it, the stuff that doesn't work that's never been performed because people always cut it. Um, and, uh, you know, partially they cut the play because it's a little too long, but also partially they, they cut the play because, yeah, there are little, little bits here and there that are a little crunchy, you know? And there's like, you know, certain logic things that we sort of just excuse, like, you know, the way in which Hamlet uh, gets uh, uh, travels like the geography in Hamlet is really all messed up and uh, uh, gra like a uh, uh, hijacked by pirates and brought back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're, what do we not get to meet the pirates? Why don't we meet the pirates? <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, anyway, and, um, thank you, Andrew. I'm going to have to go back to continue by performing or whatever this is that I'm doing. But um, but uh, I was also I was just going to quickly add that um too that Shakespeare is very lucky that he got away with just stomping all over uh, Aristotle's unities you know it's like Aristotle's had laid down exactly what to do with plays and theater and stuff like that and Shakespeare was just like nah whatever man so I just say to the young people out there like you know somebody older is going to set rules for you about what you can and can't do in theater and then there are times and you just you know you just go whatever dude <laughs> you know I'm going to do whatever the hell I now I have to go research Aristotle's unities. Oh yeah, it's like, they're rules, man. It's like, there's rules of action and activity. You can't have a main character that doesn't do something. I'm sure Shakespeare oh. looked at them like, oh yeah. <laughs> rules, man, who needs them? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Okay. Uh, okay, all right. How now, Ophelia, what's the matter? Oh, my lord, my lord, I have been so affrightened. My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, he took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then he goes to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand, thus o'er his brow, he falls of, to such a perusal of my face as it would draw it. This is the very ecstasy of love. What? Have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord. That hath made him mad. Come, we go to the king. This must be known, which being kept close might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Come. I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. I doubt it is no other than the main, his father's death and our hasty marriage. I will be brief. He wrote, O oh dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, O oh most best, believe it, and you, then evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him Hamlet. But how hath she received his love? I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not be. And then I precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his retort, admit no messengers receive no tokens, which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repelled, a short tale to make, fell into sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence to a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into the madness wherein he now raves and we all moan for. Do you think this? It may very well be the like. How, how may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks for hours together here in the lobby. At such a time, I'll lose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arius then, mark the encounter. But look, where the poor wretch comes reading. Oh, give me leave. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What's the matter, my lord? For if the sun breed maggots into a dead dog, being a good kiss and carrying, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun, 
Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. My lord, I will take my leave of you. You cannot take from me anything that I will not more willingly part with all, except my life, except my life, except my life. Fare you well, my lord. Ah, oh, these tedious old fools. Oh, my Lord, my Lord. How may we try it further? Remember me. Thou art slain. Oh, my Lord, my Lord. How may we try it further? Remember me. Thou art slain. Revenge. Revenge. Farewell. How may we try it further? Words, words, Thou words, art words, slain. Words, 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 oh, my Lord, words, words, my Lord. Words, 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 How may we try it further? Words, 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 words. You cannot take anything from me that I would not willingly Thou art part slain. You cannot take anything from me that I would not willingly Revenge. part with. You cannot take anything from me Revenge. that I would not willingly part with. You cannot take anything Revenge. from me that I would not willingly part with. Revenge. Except Farewell. Except my life. Except my life. How may we try it further? Except my life. Except remember. Thou art slain. Accept my life. Accept my Revenge. life. Accept my life. Farewell. Words, words, Remember. words, 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 words. Accept my life. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction and a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all the visage waned, tears in his eyes, distracting in his aspect a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing? What would he do? Had he the motive? and that for passion that I have. He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, made mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears, yet I, am I a coward? Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing, like a very drab, a stallion fie upon foe, about my brains. Hello, Zach. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much for joining me. Totally. Would you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, okay, Kwee My name is Zach Running Coyote. I'm an actor and playwright uh, currently on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, Treaty 7 territory, um, the city of Calgary, colon uh, colonially known as the city of Calgary. The Blackfoot people know this area as Mohinsis and uh, it's the traditional territory of the Blackfoot nations, including uh, Siksika, Gena, Bigani, and um, 
the Stony Nakoda First Nations uh, and Satana First Nation, as well as Metis Nation Region 3. That's the land that I'm on. And uh, as you know, I am sitting here in Unamaki, which is uh, colonially known as Cape Breton at the University, at Cape Breton University. And you have taught in this area. I do. I, uh, I'm still in the process of, um, I was adopted when I was six months old, and I'm still in the process of um, rebuilding my understanding of my bloodline, but uh, my ancestors were Mi'kmaq and settler people. So. Yeah, so, and you haven't, you've never been here. I have not. We must uh, correct that somehow, by the way. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you, I wanted, uh, now I, 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 uh, I, as you, so this is a Hamlet thing, a Hamlet experience. Tell me, do you have, what are your thoughts on, on Hamlet himself? Do you have thoughts about Hamlet? Yeah, I think it's complex. I don't know. I, I, the only time I've seen Hamlet live was, um, the first time I saw Hamlet was the Mel Gibson movie. <laughs> and uh, then I, I saw Andrew Scott play the role at the Almeida in London, and uh, that was a potent experience. But I don't know. I think the the indigenous relationship to to Shakespeare is is complex. Um, you know, I love doing it. I really do. I've played Romeo twice. Um, I would love to play Hamlet, but I'm constantly interrogating why 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 would I want to step into that role or any of these roles. Um, they, I don't know, these roles weren't written for my body and voice. Um, and yet I went through the theater school thing and was told why I should care about it and told how Shakespeare cared so much about the human condition. And so therefore I should care about Shakespeare. And I'm kind of, I'm disillusioned with it all right now, I guess. I, I do love speaking the words, um, but it's complex and, uh, is my desire to, like, of course I want to play Hamlet, but is that because it is actually a delicious thing or because it sounds like a delicious thing um, or a groundbreaking thing or something? So I don't know. I got, I got my eye on that guy. But I, I haven't, you know, I, I, I thought I knew about Hamlet. I'm not a Shakespeare person. I never, I wasn't ever. And now I'm sort of Found myself, found myself sort of swimming in all of this. And there were a couple of things that I found. One of the things that I, I find interesting is that it, yeah, Hamlet certainly questions, the play Hamlet certainly asks questions about Shakespeare's dramaturgy in terms of the kinds of things he wasn't concerned with. And the other thing that I, I find, I found from the reading that I've done and the people that I've talked to, that one of the things that people seem very appealed Appealing, that's appealing about Hamlet is that is that he is a kind of actor. That mm -hmm. he's an actor, acting. Oh, he's always acting, and so, and I'm I'm thinking maybe that's part of the appeal for actors to address acting mm -hmm. entirely directly. Mm -hmm. That makes a ton of sense. That, that that's something that you know. That is something that that. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of before. I mean, you know, the one of the scholarship, one of the pieces of scholarship I was looking at is this guy, Farrell Bloom, who wrote this book called The Invention of the Human, uh, which speaks of, you know, he loves Shakespeare and he talks about that. He talks about that, that you know, he invented a kind of modern human. And uh, what was your experience playing Romeo? Did you feel that you were able to bring the fullness of your own experience to that? Or did you feel that you were compromising yourself somehow? Uh, always compromising myself somehow doing Shakespeare. Um, but Romeo specifically, I, I think both times I've played the role, I've, I've felt like I'm able to bring quite a lot of myself to it. Um, I'm a lover, I'm a fighter, I'm a kid, you know? Um, the world that that Romeo's in doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, 
I had to do the text work the same as anyone does to understand it, you know, but I find that role a lot of fun. Um, which is of course where the, the tension for me begins is that it is so much fun, but I just don't, I don't know who it's for anymore. Um, my people certainly don't need Shakespeare. Is it <laughs> how it, so the notion of, um, you know, there was a period of time, I don't know if you even experienced it because you're young enough that just the, the movement of colorblind casting may have passed before you kind of landed in the scene, um, which seems like a very misguided thing now when we look at it. Uh, Well-meaning, yeah. but, um, but so, uh, so ha does, do you feel in the work that you do that it's essential to you to bring that part of your identity to bear? Always. Um... You know, I, I can't escape that part of me, can't escape any part of me really. And uh, I think that, you know, to speak to colorblind casting, I, it's still not, it's still a, a, a term that's used a lot. Um, in my theater school experience, it was used a lot. And, uh, you know, the term we're using now is, or, or moving towards using is color conscious casting. So it's not necessarily that, you know, what, what does colorblind casting mean? Like, is it, on one hand, it's this notion of casting the best person for the role, regardless of their race, which generally just means casting white people, um, because white people have had access generally to better training. Um, and and conti that continues to be true, that the volume of, of actors graduating from theater school are largely white. Um, so often, the best actor for the role in an audition where race isn't a factor is going to be white. Um, and then the colorblind casting notion either justifies that or puts people of color in precarious situations where they're the only one in a room or they're really tokenized in a room, you know. I've never experienced a director that is able to leave. You know, I'm asked to leave my race at the door, but directors never do. They always know that they're, that they're dealing with the specificity of having an ind indigenous person in whatever role they're, they're choosing. So I think that, but the idea of color conscious casting, the hope of moving towards, um, you know, I saw a production of uh, The Drawer Boy at uh, Pass Mariah a few years back. I saw that. Cat, um, that, was, that was not colorblind casting. <laughs> that was very intentional. Um, the directing team, uh, Nina and Cole, knew exactly what they were going after and why. And it was like little, like, and I knew they knew when there was a scene where, um, is it, I don't know the characters' names, is it Angus that is, that Craig played? And Craig Lozon took his shirt off and he had these tattoos as native chiefs that were not covered up and he had his medicine pouch on. And the medicine pouch was a thing that signaled to me his indigeneity was critical in the room rather than a, well, you landed the role because you were the best actor. I knew that there was intentionality and that was different than shows I've seen that felt colorblind. Um, and so I think moving forward with Shakespeare, because inevitably we're going to continue to do it. Um, we need more, we need more people of color directing Shakespeare, uh, specifically in the context of the culture they come from. And it's not gonna be perfect. I, Shakespeare, as told through a specific cultural lens, is never going to be as good as plays actually written about that culture. But for instance, I really want to adapt uh, Richard II because when I read that play, I read a man who, the way he speaks about the land and evokes the land and his, it's troubling at times and quite settler, but also at times very indigenous. And I've adapted some of his text to be from an indigenous POV and makes a lot of sense to me. So like, I am very, very interested in adaptation of Shakespeare with an indigenous bent. Um, I've been really privileged to work on Renata Arluk's Powagan uh, Mackers and, uh, 
that text is entirely adapted um, away from the Shakespeare to really have a, a Cree context. And I feel like if you're going to do the, the, the color conscious or whatever thing and, and try to be culturally specific in a non-Eurocentric way, you have to go a long ways. Um, just putting actors of different backgrounds into the same words doesn't necessarily do that. You can't, like, theme. You can't do macros with an Indigenous theme and call that Indigenous theater. Um, that's still Shakespeare. That's still white Canadian theater, but with a different um, perspective. And, you know, there's been, both, both, both things have been done. There's high-profile productions of Shakespeare shows that were done with, an indigenous theme or all indigenous cast and I I wasn't there so I have nothing bad to say about that process but I know that um there's some really brilliant people who are taking apart the words themselves and going what just doesn't work and what does um but yeah it's I don't know it's complex and like I said we're going to continue doing Shakespeare we're going to continue throwing tons of resources at it so and I, I actually dream of a world where we just don't. As a playwright, I'm not like, I'm sure you can resonate with this too. I'm not desperate to see Shakespeare be done. Um, but because we're going to keep doing it, I'm desperate to see it done with more nuance. I think what I think one of the things that I have certainly learned recently, uh, working uh, with Jill Carter as an instructor at um, U of T, um, I, start, I, be, I start became aware of, as a sort of, you know, a, a aging and clumsy settler, I, I did never really clean into the, just the idea that the, the settler-based narrative is about achievement in a way that the indigenous-based narrative is not necessarily about gaining an achievement in the same way. So that the narrative is in some ways what more web-like than sort of like arc, arced. Mm -hmm. It's so that, so when we talk about just putting sort of themes on something. We really have to go right to the very basic impulse to make a thing, to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, um, which, is, which makes it, which is beyond adaptation or, be, or certainly beyond, um, beyond um, uh, 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 well, it's deep kind of adaptation as opposed to just putting a style on it or putting a costume on it. We're gonna talk, we're gonna, you're gonna be, uh, you're going to be joining me again in April uh, to talk about this uh, with the conference we're doing here, uh, a little an evening, a little chat uh, um, about bridging uh, indigenous and settler dramaturgy in ways that we can talk a little bit about uh, how we can work together and what and honor what's in the land and 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 see how there's some maybe there's something in the settler structure that can somehow support and there's a way that we can kind of build something together that's new again mm -hmm. you know what's true is that the um the arc that forms the paradigm of settler dramaturgy versus what some would describe as a circle that forms the paradigm of indigenous dramaturgy and i'm not an expert in indigenous dramaturgy and you know as, like i say as someone who's reclaiming my roots and um, working from that place. I'm working primarily from a place of displacement and rec reclamation. But what is true is that, um, like when we talk about indigenous dramaturgy kind of working in a circle, uh, there can be a desire to simplify that and be like, well, if this is the arc, then indigenous people just come back in a circle to the beginning. And it's not just a settler arc that's bent more, <laughs> you know, it's actually a completely different paradigm. And when you describe a web, that's better for me because in the circle is a bunch of people sitting around the circle everything is done in circle but of course within a circle it's all these webs of how people are connected and all that intricacy and all that intricacy is where the the drama itself happens there's not inherently drama in just because something ends where it started doesn't mean it went in a circle or is inherently indigenous I think there can be a sometimes a, a desire in dramaturgy to apply a just apply shapes and stuff as we work in this a line or a circle or this and it's, it's it's more complex than that and really to me an indigenous practice is about relationality um between everyone and all the elements that come together in any any theatrical process um 
And that's where achievement becomes, like the achievement is the thing that's in the middle um, that is accomplished via healthy relationality um, rather than getting from point A to point B. So. And what better place to explore and discover that than theater? Right. Right. You know, and I think that, that settler artists inherently do and understand and desire the circle in the same way. Um, and yet I still see pursuit of the line, the straight line. There's an imposition and it's, I think what it comes down to that for me is this idea of, of the sort of capitalistic industrial deliver a product as opposed to invite someone to be, invite someone into a process. You know, that we've been so, we're so told that this product, 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 and we have to deliver something. And this is, I think, where we start to get in trouble when we work to production that way. Yeah. Anyway, uh, bless you for being here and taking the time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And we're going to, we'll talk again soon and we'll be back in this world in a month or so. We sure will. Okay. All Thanks right. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Farewell. Made many tenders. I shall obey, my lord. I have remembrances of yours. Long, long. Oh, woe is me. I've seen to be what I have seen. Not to be. To see that what I see. Is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office and the spurns, the patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cassette of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia, nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. My lord, I have remembrance of yours that I have longed, longed to redeliver. I pray you now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. I love you not. 
I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Get thee to a nunnery. To a nunnery, go, and quickly, to farewell. Heavenly powers restore him to a nunnery. Go. Oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown. The courtier, soldier, scholar's eye, tongue, sore, the expectation and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of four, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down, an eye of ladies most dejected and wretched that sucked the honey of his music vows. Now see what noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of time and harsh, that unmatched form and stature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen. See what I see. This book is Black Hamlet by Wolf Sachs, 1893 to 1949, a Lithuanian psychoanalyst who emigrated to South Africa in 1922. This book was published in 1937, and in his 1996 review of a new edition of the book, Leonard Bloom, no relation to Harold Bloom, says, Black Hamlet is a pioneering study that used psychoanalytic methods and insights to understand the intricate relations between an individual and his society. It gave lie to the myth still lingering that psychoanalysis is narrowly confined to the intense scrutiny of individual emotional states within the Western individualistic nuclear family. In a review of the same edition, Edward T. Moorman describes the work as a case study in psychoanalytic therapy, the report of a scientific investigation, a political polemic, a collection of ethnographic observations, and the biography of a common man whose remarkable features would otherwise have been overlooked. The book was expanded after the war and appeared several times as Black Anger, once in a series that featured books by Leroy Jones and Malcolm X. Moorman describes the study thusly. In the late 1920s, through an anthropo anthropo anthropologist friend, Sachs made the acquaintance of John Chava Fambria, the descendant of a line of Nangangas, healers, and regarded himself as a natural healer whose process of training and certification had been interrupted by his father's premature death and his own subsequent travels. Sachs, who had worked with institutionalized psychotic black Africans and was convinced that their mental illnesses were not fundamentally different than those of Europeans, saw, saw his encounter with Chava Fambria as an opportunity to test the hypothesis that the neuroses of an essentially healthy black were no different from the neuroses of Europeans and were equally susceptible to Freudian therapeutic techniques. At the same time, Sachs regarded himself as particularly sensitive to the stresses that came with being a member of a subaltern group in a colonial colony. And he, sent out, he set out to help Chava Fambria overcome his own indecisiveness and become a full human being by engaging in healing work and political activity. The book's title alludes to both Chava Fambria's hesitance to act and to the fact that his paternal uncle had taken his father's place in the family and also in the former role, in the former role of Nanganga. When writing in the journal African Affairs, South African historian Saul Dubo notes that Sachs is cautious about advancing the analogy between Hamlet and John, acknowledging that the reader might find the comparison unacceptable, quoting Sachs. John's tragedy at first glance may seem far beneath Hamlet's, and one is justified in ridiculing in, at, the, at the potential of any comparison between John the witch doctor and Hamlet the Danish prince. Thus, Sachs does not attempt to ennoble John in virtue of a direct comparison with Hamlet. He merely states that both manifest a similar psychological condition. In his review, Mormon points out that it is difficult to read Sachs' description of Chava Fambria's life and his own intervention into Chava Fambria's affairs without feeling sympathy for, um, 
without feeling sympathy for Sack's purpose and revulsion at his unconsciously condescending tone. It is, of course, worth noting that both of these reviews by Mormon and Bloom and the scholarship by Dubot are all written by white men, so one must temper any cultural assumptions made there. Though it is true, as Dubot says, that the claim that blacks and whites shared identical mental structures was highly contentious at this time. Many South African researchers seriously doubted that the mental capacities of blacks and whites were equivalent. Endless speculations by amateur anthropologists, administrators, missionaries, etc. about the nature of the native mind suggested that Africans thought differently from Europeans. In South Africa, the popular writings of social Darwinists sought to prove that blacks were fundamentally irrational, that their mental capacities were arrested at the onset of puberty, or that they were unable to free themselves as thinking individuals from the restrictive collective rep uh, this co restrictive collective representations of communal society. Within the wider colonial psychiatric community, there existed a definite belief that African insanity was different in type from white mental illness. This was considered to be reflective of the existence of basic differences in the mental structures of normal whites and blacks. So, all this considered, it is clear that Sachs's work in 1937 could be seen as radical and ultimately activist. Although even in Sachs's obituary in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, Sachs's sensitivity to cultural issues and his awareness of his inability to embody change as a white man was taken to task. The conflict, the conflict in Sachs between the thoughtful investigator and the revolutionary, though it may have enriched his personality, weakened his fervor as a revolutionary and blunted his perceptions as a scientist. Now, I would like to share with you Sachs's explanation of his own term, Hamletism. Hamletism is, is a universal phenomenon symbolizing indecision and hesitancy when action is required and reasonably expected. Many hypotheses have been put forward to explain Hamlet's incapacity to revenge his father's murder. Some see Hamlet's difficulties in his temperament, oversensitiveness, too much introspection, inborn lack of decision. Others see the causes of his failure in external circumstances, which were stupendous enough to have deterred anyone. The modern psychologist rejects these explanations, for he maintains that Hamlet was by nature capable of action, and the task was a possible one. Hamlet's hesitancy cannot be explained in terms of conscious reasons, for his hesitation is due to an internal conflict to fulfill his filial duty and some special cause for repugnance towards it. But Hamlet himself is not conscious of this special cause. His conflict is inaccessible to his own introspection, for it is unconscious, as explained by Freud. So Freud's explanation of that Sachs is referring to is that of an Oedipal complex, reminding us of Freud's insistence that Shakespeare was invoking the Oedipal in his crafting of the character. Harold Bloom certainly would not agree with that, nor does Mark Robson, who in Oedipal visuality, Freud, Romanticism, and Hamlet, points out that the Hamlet origin myth predates the Oedipal myth, and so continues, Freud's reading of Hamlet in terms of the Oedipus complex exemplifies the central recognition of his own text. He becomes legible as a reader to the extent that he remains unaware of his own originality. Misreading himself, he offers a clue to the riddle of his relation to a romantic and especially German tradition, only a temporarily dislocated failure to reconcile his claims with his knowledge. In his desire to solve the riddle of Oedipus and Hamlet by invoking desire, he gives voice to his desire for an Oedipal forgetting of his own father figures. This line of thought I find very useful when considering why the play Hamlet and its lead character presents the theater practitioner with a dramaturgical blank slate upon which to craft and connect narrative. Indeed, even at the very core of Sachs' argument of inactivity, we could see more easily, certainly through Bloom's lens, that the problem is not in action as a character weakness, but a conscious philosophical understanding of the impossibility of action. Not only in this tale, but generally. Perhaps with Chava Fambria. Perhaps no much. Perhaps it's not so much as Beckett offers that we are born astride a grave, but rather between to be and not. Enter a king and a queen, the queen embracing him and he her. He takes her up and declines his head upon her neck. 
He lies him down upon a bank of flowers. She, seeing him asleep, leaves him. Anon come in another man, takes off the sleeper's crown, kisses it, pours poison in the sleeper's ear, and leaves him. The queen returns, finds the king dead, makes passionate action. The poisoner, with some three or four, come in again, seem to condole with her. The dead body is carried away. The poisoner woos the queen with gifts. She seems harsh a while, but in the end, accepts love. Give me some light. Give me some light. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Have you forgot me? Come, come, and sit you down. You shall not budge, you go not, till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help, ho! What? Ho! Help! How now? A rat dead, 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 Dead. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this! A bloody deed, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty. Ay, me, what act? Look here upon this picture and this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear, blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter my ears. A murderer and a villain. A slave that is not twentieth part the kith of your prescient lord. No more. A king of shreds and patches. Revenge. My breast surrounded by jealousy and death, I can't be reached. Only have a contract underneath, separate from you 
They do die over and over. They die all the time, which is not really dying, that's just living. Like being born astride a grave, as the old man said, the other old man. Like being stuck between to be and not just like living trapped inside this memory. But there's a way out of the memory. Would you like to get out? Yes. Reduce the play to its one essential minute and then it will collapse inside itself and disappear and then you will be free. Hamlet, where is Polonius? At supper. At supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service, two dishes but to one table. That's the end, alas. Alas, a man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost thou mean by this? Nothing but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send thither to see. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. But if indeed you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go seek him there. He will stay till you come. Hamlet, this deed for thine especial safety, which we do tender, as we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself, the bark is ready, and the wind at help, the associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England? Aye, Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewest our purposes. I see a cherub that sees them, but come for England. Farewell. 
dear mother, thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother, father and mother is man and wife. Man and wife is one flesh, and so my mother. Come, for England. <sighs> St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning the time, and I have made it your window to be your Valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes, and up the chamber door, let in the maid, let out a maid, never departed more. By Jizz and by St. Charity, alack and fie for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it, by cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So would I have done by yonder sun, and thou hadst not come to my bed. Hello, Stephen. How are you, Daniel? Would you like to introduce yourself, please? My name is Stephen Page. Singer, composer, songwriter, musician, guitar colleague collector. of... Guitar collector. Yes, definitely guitar collector. Uh, so thank you very much for... Um, agreeing to speak with me a little bit. Uh, now, uh, it's funny because uh, uh, we were, a year ago, we were in Stratford, uh, the, the center of Shakespearean behavior or whatever in this country uh, when, when we had to leave, but um, uh, working there. Uh, anyway, but I, you were very kind and you sent me a bunch of the music uh, that you made for a production of Hamlet there. Um, which I, which um, uh, we're using here tonight. Uh, and um, I wanted to just uh, ask you a little bit about that production and what you remember of it, its tone and whatnot. Sure. Well, it was uh, directed by Anthony Cimolino and I've worked with, with Anthony a bunch at the Stratford Festival. And his approach to, um, to, to the text was, he was setting it, sometime in the in the early 20th century before the great war but not long before that you know kind of this sense this what i would consider the you know the modernist era the blooming of the of, of modernism was happening um and that was in science and that was in literature and art and it was in uh you know the heart and the sentiment of young people and and, and young people the meaning and the weight that you, that youth had was changing. That idea of old, the old guard leaving and the new guard coming in and being, having an element of kind of existential confusion, similar to Hamlet's in the text. And uh, so we said it, said it in Denmark, but the Denmark of let's say 1910. And uh, so for me, I tried to figure out like what does music from Denmark in 1910 sound like. Well, I'm not going to be a purist about it. I don't, I don't, I, you know, I pulled out Nielsen string quartets as an, as a, as a, an inspiration, but I also started to think about things like the early days of electronics. We're not far off from the beginnings of the vacuum tube and, uh, and, you know, early synthesizers and, you know, they're right there on the cusp of, of, uh, of, the new sounds of the 20th century. And I thought that's, that's what I'll do is I'll take the idea of old being the string quartets and the folk music and the, the standard kind of battle music and so on. And then you juxtapose that with some of these same melodies, but put into new instruments, you know, instruments that may, may sound kind of quaintly Dr. Who-ish to the, uh, the, us, but if I was to put my head inside of that world back then, it would sound very foreign and very uh, fantastical. That's so interesting. I didn't know that. And it, it does, and it, and it really does convey a kind of new old. It really yeah. does. It has this feeling of, it has a vaguely 
uh, uh, Gary Newman kind of uh, like, you know, a, a sort of modern, but this, but, her, but sort of taking from something old. It's yeah, very. Right. It's a mix of those things and how that, even that, that modernism for us in music is kind of, it's easy to feel uh, nostalgic about it because it feels it's kind of somewhere between the fifties and the seventies is where that fits in our minds. But imagine being in the 19 twenties or thirties and hearing these brand new sounds or developing these brand new sounds. And it's the same time as we start getting into the, all kinds of changes in how humans started to think about the planet and about science and all those things happening at the same time um, led to uh led to all kinds of questions. And that's what Hamlet's all about, is about all those giant questions. So you, you're, you, I think you had said this to me before that, that it was, I think you said that this was kind of the new order, old order Hamlet that he was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that uh, Fortinbras was the new, the new representing the new and King Hamlet was the old. And that was the, do, do you remember if um this might be, uh, this is probably a, do you remember? I've heard that it, I've heard people talk about Claudius being represented as sympathetic because he was getting rid of the old order somehow. Does that ring a bell for you? In see, I, I to to me in this production, I looked at you know, I think one of the things you have to do, I don't know, as for in, in my as, as as the composer on a play. I feel like my job is not to judge whether someone's a good guy or a bad guy, whether someone's a, uh, a it, what they're, I'm just there to support often how like you help, you help the audience along, but you also help that character along. And I, th I think the approach here was that Claudius doesn't see himself as a conniving scheming uh, grabber. He's he, uh, of grabber of power. He just, I think he sees himself as doing what he had to do. That was the that was the ethical and moral choice, and it doesn't jibe necessarily with how Hamlet, the young Hamlet, sees him. Uh, you know, so he's in between the two Hamlets, um, but I think he feels like he's being sensible. Uh, let me ask you then, since we're speaking to character, uh, and because you had to, you obviously were very focused on Ophelia because you were writing her songs and. Right. Um, what it, what was what's what was your feeling Ophelia feeling? I, I, I just say that because I it is such a dramaturgical bump in the play um, because there's the, the playwright did not choose chose not to include any scenes in which we see any positive affection between from Hamlet to her and right right so the. I think a lot of directors end up sort of doing a little sort of like, oh, a tableau at the beginning where they're flirting or running or chasing one another or having a bit of fun. But that's not, the playwright uh, did not do that. What, what was the Ophelia take here? I think the take that, that, that they went with there was more like, I think it was, there was a conscious decision to try to make her seem um, not frail, but rather somebody who was so burdened by by her sense of morality and the failures of everybody around her, including Hamlet, I think. Um, and, you know, the one thing they really tried to show was the sense of love and affection in her own family, you know, with her father and brother. And, and so Polonius is less of a bumbler, I think, in, in this production than we see him other times. Um, you see him as a loving father and there's that sense of safety and that she has to leave it. She has to leave it in order to be a truth teller. I think that's how that burden just becomes too strong. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you just uh, finally, just to talk a little bit about that. I mean, you said to me, you've done uh, as you like it, Coriolanus. Um, what else have you done? Cymbeline and a Scottish play. Yes, thank you. And then I also did Ben Johnson, uh, uh, Bartholomew Fair. And in, what, what would you, 
what are what what I guess would be the challenge or and or the joy of working with I would say sp specifically with Shakespeare as a composer. Sure. Well, um the one of the great joys is like I love it when there's I mean there are songs in the text in almost every play. There's something there and most people just choose to if you look at the text, you know, you gloss, it becomes either part of dialogue or stuff gets cut anyways, or um, like you don't see it or hear it in, in the audience as a, as a song. And I try and jump onto those right away. Cause um, if you get to uh, work with a really good lyricist, it's pretty easy coming, <laughs> coming up with songs. So they're gifts to me. And also for me, they really help me um, determine the musical motifs. Like if I, if I can, latch on to four songs even if they're two couplets or whatever else and even if they don't get sung inside the play i use those as a way to, for me to start to dig into the musical themes so i love that and the other thing i about writing music for for theater and particularly for for shakespeare is you know I'm so used to writing music that is for me, you know, it's for, I'm in the spotlight and I'm singing my songs to an audience, but here I am making music that is all about supporting the actors, the lighting designer, the, you know, the, the um, director, but most of all, you're there to support the text, um, which is such a different way of composing for me that it's, I think it's made me a better writer. So I'll thank Shakespeare for that, but, um, I think one of the greatest things is that it's, I love the process of sitting around the table with the cast and the creative team. And for me, that's how I get to learn the text. I can sit and read it a million times, but it's in that thing. We, and listening to an actor find what it, like what it actually is over the course of rehearsals, it informs my work so much. And it just, you know, breaks my brain open I feel like it's like like Shakespeare more than so many other uh, uh, writers allows for so much interpretation that way um, for an actor to interpret or for a director to interpret so for me as a as a composer it just feels like if I did if I was writing the music for the same production of Hamlet but with a different actor playing Hamlet would the music work as well? I don't know. I think there's a lot of room for everybody to change that text without changing any words, even. Yeah. I, I, so, the, and the, so that 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 interesting that that challenge um, is actually something that you feel has the challenge of sort of needing to sort of step back, a little step into, is that's right has been helpful. It, very much so. Although it's you know. It, it, the world of deadlines is a crazy one where it's like, well, we need to have all the music ready to go and either taught to the actors if they're performing it or recorded or whatever it may be at a certain point. And it's just, you know, I wish I had a little more time just to watch the actors live in their roles. You know, it's just what you can do with a film, right? If you're scoring a film, you get to see that finished work when you're scoring a play. Um, quite often you have to have that ready before it's set on the stage. And then you have to just hope that it still works. Um, the, I, 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 just to finish, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm using um, this evening, I'm using uh, a talk that W.H. Auden gave uh, in 1947 on Hamlet. He was not a fan. <laughs> and um, he says it was. He said he his it is it is his belief uh, that Shakespeare himself was dissatisfied with the play. Um, I I I don't know. Like okay, that's fine. But I I are you are you a Hamlet fan? I, you know, there's lots of times where I think shut up. You know, like there's there, there's that element to it. Sometimes you're like come on. But it's also like I think a good production with good performers can bring an audience to understand as much as could, can be understood. I like the fact that there are so many possibilities in the text. And I like the fact that uh, like Hamlet is, there's no stereotype or he's maybe he became a stereotype, but as a character, 
it doesn't like it doesn't fit in some in a in a kind of archetypal plan for me I, and that's why i love that about it but it's not like i walk away from it thinking that is the great outline for how plays should be excellent and i know thank you i thank you for uh archetypable because i i'm going to use that that's i've never it's, it's, a, it's a, very, <laughs> a grad school word <laughs> i made it up i really like you it. though it's a, that's my gift thank you i appreciate it i'm definitely going to use it i'll cite you uh Thank you, Stephen. Drowned, drowned, drowned.
W. H. Auden at the New School of Social Research, New York, February 12, 1947. If a work is quite perfect, it arouses less controversy and there is less to say about it. Curiously, everyone tries to identify with Hamlet, even actresses, and in fact, Sarah Bernhardt did play Hamlet, and I'm glad to say she broke her leg in doing it. One, one says that one is like a character, but one does not say, this is me. One says, I am more like Claudius, perhaps, than I, like, I am like Laertes, or I would rather be Benedict than Orsino. But when a reader or a spectator is inclined to say, this is me, it becomes slightly suspicious. It is suspicious when all sorts of actors say, this is a part I would like to do, not, this is a part I have a talent to do. I would question whether anyone has succeeded in playing Hamlet without appearing ridiculous. Hamlet is a tragedy where there is a part left open as a part is left open for an improv improvisational actor in a farce, but here the part is left open for a tragedian. Shakespeare took a great deal of time over this play. With a writer of Shakespeare's certainty of execution, a delay of this kind is a sign of some dissatisfaction. He has not got the thing he wants. T.S. Eliot has called the play an artistic failure. Hamlet, the one inactive character, is not well integrated into the play and not adequately motivated, though the active characters are excellent. Polonius is a pseudo-practical dispenser of advice who is a kind of voyeur where the sex life is his of his children is concerned. Laertes likes to be a dashing man of the world who visits all houses, but don't you touch my sister, and he is jealous of Hamlet's intellect. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are yes-men, Gertrude is portrayed as a woman who likes to be loved, who likes to have romance in her life, and Horatio is not too bright, though he has read a lot and can repeat it. The plays of the period in which Shakespeare wrote Hamlet have a great richness, but one is not sure that at this point he even wants to be a dramatist. Hamlet offers strong evidence of this indecision because it indicates what Shakespeare might have done if he had had an absolutely free hand. He might well have confined himself to dramatic monologues. The soliloquies in Hamlet, as well as other plays of this period, are detachable both from the character and the plays. In earlier as well as later works, they are more integrated. The to be or not to be soliloquy in Hamlet is a clear example of a speech that can be separated from both the character and the play, as are the speeches of Ulysses on time, in Troilus and Cressida uh, on the king's honor, in All's Well That Ends Well, and, and uh, the Duke in, on death in the measure, of measure for Measure. Shakespeare at this time is interested in various technical problems. The first is the relation between the prose and verse in the plays. In the early plays, the lower comic characters, Shylock as well as Lancelot Gobo in The Merchant of Venice, for example, speak prose. An intellectual character like Falstaff speaks prose in contrast to a passionate character like Hotspur who speaks verse. And as you like it, contrary to tradition, both the hero and the heroine speak prose. In Twelfth Night, Viola speaks verse at court and prose to herself, and the characters in the play who are false or have no sense of humor speak verse. Those who are wiser and have some self-knowledge speak prose. In the tragedy, Shakespeare develops an extremely fertile prose style for the tragic characters. Hamlet speaks both verse and prose. He speaks verse to himself in his soliloquies and in speeches of violent passion to others, as in the scene with his mother. He otherwise usually speaks prose to other people. There is a highly developed relation of prose and poetry in all the plays of this period. In the last plays, Shakespeare exploits verse more exclusively and tends to use prose when he is bored or when he needs to fill in the gaps. In Antony and Cleopatra, the boring characters use prose, the rounded characters verse. Shakespeare is also developing a more flexible verse. He started off with the end-stopped Marlovian and lyric lines that were suited to high passion. In Hamlet, he experiments with the caesura, the stop in the middle of the line, to develop a middle voice, a voice neither passionate nor prosaic. Hamlet also shows the development in Shakespeare's use of the double adjective, from such a phrase as sweet and honeyed sentences in Henry V, which is tautological, he moves to pairs of adjectives in Hamlet that combine the abstract and concrete. Laertes, and keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. For example, Horatio's, these are but wild and whirling words, my, my lord, and Hamlet's, led by a delicate and tender prince. George Ryland's book, Words and Poetry, is very good on Shakespeare's language and style. In this period also, Shakespeare appears to be tired of writing comedy, which he could do almost too well. He was probably bored because of his facility in the genre. 
Comedy is limited in the violence of language and emotion it can present, although Shakespeare can include a remarkable amount of both in his comedies. But though he wants to get away from comedy, he doesn't want to go back to the crude rhetoric of King John and Richard III or to the lyric and romantic rhetoric of Romeo and Juliet and Richard II. He doesn't want a childish character who doesn't know what is going on, like Romeo or Richard II, nor a crude character like Brutus, who is a puppet in a plot of historical significance where the incidents are more important than the characters. Finally, he doesn't want a character of fat humor that the situation must be constructed to reveal. And having done Falstaff, he doesn't want to go back to the crude character. Shakespeare's very success as a dramatic poet may have led him to a kind of dissatisfaction with his life that is reflected in Hamlet. A dramatic poet is the kind of person who can imagine what anyone can feel. And he begins to wonder, what am I? What do I feel? Can I feel? Artists are inclined to suffer not from too much emotion, but rather from too little. The business of being a mirror, you begin to question the reality of the mirror itself. Shakespeare develops Hamlet from a number of earlier characters who are in differing ways proto-Hamlets. Richard II is a child full of self-pity who acts theatrically but who is not like Hamlet conscious of acting. Falstaff is like Hamlet, an intellectual character and the work of an artist who is becoming aware of his full powers, but he is not conscious of himself in the way Hamlet is. When Falstaff does become conscious of himself, he dies, almost suicidally. Brutus anticipates Hamlet by being, in a sense, his opposite. Hamlet is destroyed by his imagination. Brutus is destroyed by repressing his imagination, like the stoic he is. He tries to e exclude possibility. The nearest to Hamlet is, is Jacques who remains unexplained and can take no part in the action. It is perhaps more important to consider the sources of this play rather than any other of Shakespeare's plays. The story of Hamlet originally appears in Saxo Grammaticus's Historica Danica, but Shakespeare went to Belfort's Histoires Tragiques for an expanded and moralized version of the story. Belfort's tale was translated into English in 1608. Another influence was Thomas Kidd's play, The Spanish Tragedy, a prototype of the revenge play, which was printed in 1594 and was exceptionally popular on the Elizabethan stage. The first major exploration of the idea of revenge occurs in the Orestia, the legend of Orestes, Agamemnon, and Clytemestra. Saxo's version of the Hamlet story had comparatively little to do with emotions. Revenge is treated as an absolute duty. Elizabethan plays, though a wrong is done a person, the wronged one carries his grievances too far and Nemesis turns back on him. Shylock is an instance. What was a duty now becomes a question of passion and hatred. Hamlet's disgust and revulsion toward his mother, for example, seem out of all proportion to her actual behavior. Hamlet has many faults. It is full of holes, both in action and motivation. The sketchy portrayal of Fortinbras is one. We hear early about his plans when Claudius sends word for him to stop. Fortinbras agrees, but wants permission to pass through Denmark on his way to Poland. We see him pass across the stage on his way to Poland, and he returns when everyone is dead. This subplot is needed, but it is not properly incorporated into the play. The action involving Laertes also poses problems. When Laertes returns from France a second time, why hasn't someone told him Hamlet killed his father when he storms the palace? Why is all the excitement over in a few moments? Polonius is secretly buried. Why? Polonius's death is necessary to get Laertes back to England, but again, the subplot is not really knit into the action. And why does Claudius delay in killing Hamlet and make elaborate plans which could miscarry? Ophelia is a silly, repressed girl and is obscene and embarrassing when she loses her mind over her father's death, but though her madness is very shocking and horrible, it is not well motivated. She was not so wild about her meddling papa, nor was she tremendously interested in papa. Hamlet's age is a great mystery. His, con his conversation with the clown suggests he is about 30 years old, but if he is, why is he still a university student? And if he is young enough to be a student, his speeches, which sound mature and middle-aged, are inappropriate to him. And how old then is Gertrude? Was Hamlet ever seriously in love with Ophelia? He says so in the end. I loved Ophelia, 40,000 brothers could not, with all their quantity of love, make up my sum. But we may wonder, Hamlet's earlier disgust with Ophelia and his repudiation, rep repudiations of her are in any case out of proportion to what we see of their relation and poorly motivated. He suspects her of being a spy, which probably came from an earlier version of Hamlet in which she was a spy on him. Finally, why doesn't Claudius react to the dumb show? Why wait till the play within the play? This suggests that there was an earlier version with a dumb show and a later one with a play within the play. 
and that Shakespeare incorporated both without bothering uh, about the rest of the speeches. The Elizabethans had a number of conventions about ghosts. A ghost would appear to the guilty party or call for vengeance. He would haunt a place where he was not properly buried. His appearance could be a portent. And if he had buried money in his lifetime and not told his heirs where to find it, it was his duty to let them know. Horatio asks all the proper questions of a ghost. Hamlet's melancholy, finally, is hard to relate to the body of the play, and his last speech has the same kind of vanity as the suicide note. Had I but time, as this fell sergeant death is strict in his arrest, oh, I could tell you, but let it be, Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest, report me and my cause, all right, to the unsatisfied, oh, good Horatio, what a wounded name, things standing thus unknown, shall live behind me, if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Hamlet's procrastination, Hamlet can act when outward circumstances threaten him in any way, and when he does, as in his killing of Polonius, he shows a considerable lack of feeling. The play within the play, he engineers and directs, is presented not as a comic but a tragic contradiction where the innocence of the players is contrasted with the guilt of the people who speak well and what is meant to entertain in a harmless way causes real suffering. Hamlet is intensely self-absorbed, and that self-interest continues to the very last moment. He delays. The task is to choose oneself to accept the now, not to say, the time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Uh, I would be all right if things were different. I must not want to be someone else. I must realize that I mustn't hide part of myself from myself and make the situation easier than it is in the way Brutus does. I have to choose myself. How can I transcend the self I have accepted and then forget all about it? I must not leave this choice to fate or circumstances as a person who plunges into dissipation or uncoordinated action does. I mustn't say I can't deal with life because my mother didn't love me or my mother loved me too much or whatever it is. Hamlet could either avenge his father promptly or he could say it is my business to judge other people it's God's business he does neither instead he finds the situation interesting and takes takes note on how one may smile and smile and be a villain aversion keeps one related but detached either hatred or love means an alteration in situation why doesn't he act he has to find an answer to the question who am I he lacks a basic sense of reason for existence at all Hamlet lacks a faith in God and in himself Consequently, he must define his existence in terms of others, e.g., I am the man whose mother married his uncle who murdered his father. He would like to become what the Greek tragic hero is, a creature of situation. Hence, his inability to act, for he can only act, i.e., play at possibilities. He is fundamentally bored. And for that reason, he acts theatrically. The play is written entirely out of spite against actors, and by its nature, the role of Hamlet cannot be done by an actor. An actor can act everything except an actor. Hamlet should be played by an actor brought in off the street, and the rest of the characters should be professional actors. The point about Hamlet is that he's an actor, and you can't act yourself. You can only be yourself. It is no longer possible for people to believe in something because a lot of other people do. To believe in something is not now a naive act. The normal reaction is to try not to go forward, but rather to retreat from desire and will back to passion where one can act. The cost, however, is the sacrifice of one's reason, and you have to invent a terrific kind of technique to arouse such a passion and reflective people. The opposite of a passionate leap into fate is a gratuitous leap into inactivity, like Iago's. Kierkegaard writes in Either Or that boredom is the root of all evil. Starting from a principle is affirmed by people of experience to be a very reasonable procedure. I am willing to humor them and so begin with the principle that all men are bores. Surely no one will prove himself so great a bore as to contradict me in this. The principle possesses the quality of being in the highest degree repellent, an essential requirement in the case of negative principles, which are in the last analysis the principles of all motion. It is not merely repellent, but infinitely forbidding, and whoever has this principle back of him cannot but receive an infinite impetus forward to help him make new discoveries. For if my principle is true, one need only consider how ruinous boredom is for humanity, and by properly adjusting the intensity of one's concentration upon on this fundamental truth attain any desired degree of momentum. Should one wish to attain the maximum momentum, even to the point of almost endangering the driving power, one need only say to oneself, boredom is the root of all evil. Strange that boredom in itself, so staid and stolid, should have such a power set in motion. The influence it exerts is altogether magical, except that it is not the influence of attraction, but of repulsion. 
Boredom, Kierkegaard says, is the demonic side of pantheism. Pantheism is, in general, characterized by fullness. In the case of boredom, we find the precise opposite, since it is characterized by emptiness. But it is just this which makes boredom a pantheistic conception. Boredom depends on the nothingness which pervades reality. It causes a dizziness like that produced by looking down into a yawning chasm. In this, this dizziness is infinite. to cut his throat in the church. Oh, treble woe, fall ten times double on that cursed head whose wicked deed thy most ingenious sense deprived thee of. The devil take thy soul! Whose grave is this? To cut his throat in the church. It's mine. Oh, treble woe, what man do you dig it for? Fall from? ten times double on that cursed head whose wicked deed for no thy man. most ingenious sense deprived thee of. Whose grave is this? The devil take, the devil take, the devil take, the devil Who take thy soul. The devil take, the devil take, the devil take, the devil take, the devil take thy soul. Now she's dead. Hello, Caroline. Hello. Thank you Hello, for uh, thank you for um, joining me. My pleasure. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? I've had everybody introduce themselves. Oh, hi. I'm uh, uh, trying to get the glare off my glasses. I'm Caroline Gillis. Uh, I'm an actor. I've been an actor for over thirty years in Toronto. I've worked a lot with Daniel, much to my great fortune and uh right now i'm working in a cookie shop during the pandemic Woo! not just any cookie shop it's like, a, <laughs> like a, cook, a theater cookie shop a theater cookie shop uh yeah i'm working at craig's cookies All right it's um a big deal in in uh ontario yeah but it made the made the cape breton post i see right. or was that the chronicle herald i'm not sure if it was chronicle herald or the cape breton so post. uh as I, i've mentioned before that we are uh we are presenting this uh, at Cape Breton University in the Boardmore Playhouse. So yes, welcome back to the Boardmore Playhouse, Caroline. Thank you, thank you. The uh, Boardmores were life changing for me, Elizabeth and uh, Harry. Uh, they, I, I tried to go to theater school at Dalhousie. I auditioned and did not get into the acting program, and I had no backup plan. And so I went back to Cape Breton and uh, just did shows with them at the Playhouse. And they really did change my life. They, they made me feel like it was I could do something. And uh, I said the word fucking for the first time in the Playhouse, in front of my mother, wild, in wow. uh, Sam Shepard's Buried Child. Wow, that wasn't, so, so that wasn't a Shakespeare play. No, it wasn't. So let me no, ask you a little bit about, I just wanna ask you just a, a little bit about, so I mean, I know so much of, life and so on but I so I'll say this I know this so uh, you 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 went to Stratford and you were in what they called the young company was that what mm -hmm. it was yeah and had you been doing Shakespeare before that or was it kind of un no it was unknown territory to me uh, I think I had a few monologues that I did for auditions and stuff um but it was kind of unknown to me and uh I had the Good fortune of working with Richard Rose on uh, Our Country's Good at, at uh, the Great Canadian Theatre Company. And then one of the women in his young company, which kind of ran a span of about three years with the, generally the same people, uh, she decided not to come back in the second year. So um, Richard just asked me if I would uh, um, like to be part of it. So it was awesome. I actually learned stuff like it was kind of like going to theatre school for me because I never did get to go to theatre school. So um so i it was like a training program 
and Shakespeare. And Richard even admitted that he was sort of just learning about it himself a little bit. And uh, so it was kind of nice to learn with him, kind of methods with him of how to approach it. And it was great. It was, was it daunting, uh, the Shakespeare stuff at first? Um, no, I had... Hmm. Being in the company was a little daunting just because I had not been part of it before. But it was kind of like a, a young company that was from 25 to 35, because I think I was actually 34 when I was there. So it was a good time to go because I had done a lot of stuff with you and a lot of independent theater. So it was actually a perfect time to go because I was able to, I had a certain confidence in what I could do, but I knew I had something to learn. So I, I don't think it was daunted so much by the material, just by my own insecurities about joining a new group. And uh, I think just, I really liked working with Richard and then I felt comfortable because uh, he did a lot of exercises where we would stay line then we would say it as Caroline would say it and then you would say it again and just kind of trying to take the uh take the stink off it as it were take the stink off it make it just try and make it feel like it's just coming out of you that's your own words yeah there's a there is a um uh yeah there's I I I I, I I'm not a Shakespearean person uh and uh, I struggle with some 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 of the dramaturgy on it, really. Uh, but mm -hmm. but then you you've done then you did recently you did uh, Jacques. Uh, Jacques, yes. Jacques. Why isn't it Jacques? But anyway, Jacques. Um, yes. In from. Um, I did it at Driftwood Theater. It's like a, a small touring theater company where you set it up and take it down. Um, Bring yes. it here to Southern Ontario. Yeah, yeah, and greater Toronto area. Right. Um, and uh, it was fun doing that. It's funny, though, uh, um, thinking about doing an Ophelia who is, you know, 59 or something like that is funny because most of us actresses who are 59 now, we can only play male parts in Shakespeare. So, uh, it seems that way. The summer that I was playing Jaques, I think uh, Elizabeth Saunders was also playing Jaques, and she's the same age as me, a really good actress. <laughs> she was playing it, I think, at the St. Lawrence Festival in Quebec. Um, and I think Shauna McKenna played Jaques, I believe, I could be wrong about that one, in uh, Stratford. It just seems like that all of a sudden, like you, you, you're not the ingenue, and then you just get to play man. I also played like about ten years ago the friar in Romeo and Juliet, and Benvolio. So, yeah, usually I play men. So, the idea of playing a part that I probably wouldn't have even got when I was twenty, um, be pretty interesting. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, but I love doing Shakespeare. I, I don't know what it is about it. I find it. I find it challenging, but I find it really interesting. And I have to, I have to paraphrase it for myself every time. Like every time it's like reading it anew. Uh, like it's, it's like another language. Yeah, I, I knew that. I know that about you, that you, 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 you enjoy doing it. And, and it, it, it hasn't been really until I got involved in this Hamlet thing that um, <laughs> I started to uh, appreciate the language. But, <laughs> You know, there's um, yeah, the 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 I I, I, I like the idea of, of a bunch of, of us old people playing all these youngsters uh, too, um, and uh, as you know, I have my mother playing Gertrude, which I is, love it, I love it, a 97 year old Gertrude, which makes it's... Gertrude and and Claudius my mother and Daniel Brooks, which is uh, <laughs> funny that's pairing. pretty interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, um. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, um, well, thank you for um, participating. Uh, mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And okay. um, also, I just think we should give a little shout out to, uh, because your the painting behind you does yes. feature rather prominently uh, throughout. Uh, and I think uh, we should talk a bit, well, that's Kirsten Johnson's work. Mm -hmm. And it's a painting, uh, the portrait is, uh, the model is her sister Sigrid. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that for me. 
I someday want to buy it from you, but I said that to you about 10 years ago and you said no. Not for sale. I'm never giving it back. I'm never we'll giving it back. We'll go to, it'll be small claims court or whatever. Or maybe by that point, it'll be like- <laughs> Oh this. no, and now you have evidence for me saying I'm never giving it back. Hey, that's it. You will go with me everywhere now. Set it on Zoom. Uh, well, okay. uh, I anyway, well, I enjoy your answer. Can I ask you a question, a quick question oh. about- Hamlet yeah. and like your thoughts because we've had oh, talked a little yeah. bit about Ophelia. Sure, yeah, we're fun. I'm actually curious about do you think he ever was really in love with her? Like, yeah. you know, he throws himself on the grave. Like, like I, I, I can't remember. Like, what actually I, I don't feel like anything happened to them, yeah. or was it this? Yeah, there's nothing that. I mean, often directors will stage these little sort of like silent little scenes that at the beginning where they're flirting or chasing one another. So there's <laughs> nothing in the text that indicates even the love letters that he writes, um, even in the love letters that he writes to her are kind mm -hmm. of like, I love you bestest of all. Like it, they're so like, they're so <laughs> badly written, like Shakespeare, it seems like he's making a comment. I mean, either it's lazy dramaturgy or there's, yeah. which I don't want to believe, but you know but um no it feels very much like um the, 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 a lot of this the scholarship that i've been reading leans into the fact that uh hamlet is an actor um right. harold mm -hmm. blooms is a playwright actor in fact that he, mm -hmm. he writes himself uh and that he's just acting at all like he plays it all um you i don't know how well you know the play but there's there's a, one of the most genuine moments he has is a speech that he delivers to Laertes before their duel where he kind of apologizes for being an asshole and mm. and it's almost the most genuine thing he does to Laertes but 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 it's not really about Ophelia at all it's about it's about um the way he reacted to Laertes and and kill, and having killed his father uh right right so <laughs> a little guilt there. Sorry about that but no, I, I, it's, it's really, it, it's funny because this little thing that we're doing here, this little long thing, mm -hmm. as I've been putting it together and putting it together and now doing it, uh, it, Ophelia plays very prominently. Her, her presence is really felt in it. And I think it's because I feel a real um, lack of her being represented properly. Uh, mm -hmm the dramaturgy is terrible unless he you know shakespeare was trying to make a point about mothers mm -hmm. the woman the mother the, the i don't know um yeah i know i know yeah or maybe it's just a tacked on thing at the end oh yeah let's make him really a really dramatic scene of him at her grave kind of thing well there's but there's also this big conversation about his age right because Harold Bloom maintains that who a scholar, a, a Shakespearean scholar who wrote The Invention of the Human. You heard of him. <laughs> I um, haven't. So him. he maintains that there's like Hamlet, but like Hamlet for the first four acts and then Hamlet in the fifth act. And that this trip, this the this boat trip where the pirates intervene, which was right. like, people just cut that stuff. But yeah. is that, that that changes him and he comes back a man. Right. And that the Hamlet we see in Act Five is the, is the Hamlet that's like, um, like no longer the boy, and you know. But he even he ages himself in in the in Act Five as by by the, the way he talks in Act Five he has to be in his thirties, but he's a student at Wittenberg in the first part of the play, so he's like right. a, he's got to be in grad school um, if he's a student. Yeah. But anyway, anyway. Uh, so interesting. Yeah, so so no, I was just curious. It's incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. uh, the yeah, and 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 my job here is is uh, to to um, reduce the entire play to uh, one minute. Um, one minute. One minute. Nice. Yeah, which I, nice. which I which I which I I'm going to do. And I, I know it, I'm not going to tell you what it is because we want people to uh, wow to stay wow. <laughs> huh, amazing a minute yeah you'll have to watch and see all right i i, I will um these i must be feeling ophelia because i feel like death warmed over today uh you've had your vaccine <laughs> that's right <laughs>
That's right. Congratulations. Thank you. Something now good everybody you. knows I'm going to turn 60 this year. Oh, and now I just said it. That's one benefit. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, cool. Okay. Well, it's been fun to do it. Fun to talk about I, it. What a, I will think I'm, I'm blessed by your presence. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye. Give them the foils. Come, my lord. Hamlet, here's to thy house. Give him the cup. The queen crowns us to thy fortune, Hamlet. It is the poison cup. It is too late. Oh, my dear Hamlet. The drink, the drink, I am poisoned. Let the door be locked. Treachery, seek it out. It is here, Hamlet. Thou art slain. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unbated and in venom. He is justly served. Blow a kiss, kick a hole in your speaker, and then split. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Take up the bodies. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. This is the essence, the feeling. One minute and then freedom. And then the club will be closed, the memory will be ended. Maybe the theaters will open again. One minute and then freedom. Time me. The rest is silence. Oh.